maybe. Okay. Cool. So, uh, hello, fellow anthropologists. Welcome to yet another live streamed lesson. Um, today, I just wanted to take a few moments to talk about, I guess, interpreting geophysical data. So, in the field, we've been doing a lot of uh, metal detection, uh, sticking a metal rod in the ground, uh, essentially sticking a soil probe in the ground, um, and doing electrical resistivity, which is basically taking uh, electrodes, placing them in the ground, and then measuring the resistance of pumping a current through those electrodes and seeing how fast that current takes to get to the other electrode. Um, and all of that to basically say, we're trying to look at what's underneath the surface so that we don't have to dig up the entire survey area. So what um, we did initially was capture this data in 50 centimeter by one meter increments and a 10 by 10 meter grid square. Um, we're gonna be looking at one of them today. Um, it's our second grid square, not that it matters too much for those of you who might be watching and not being in my um, archeology span class for this semester. Suffice to say, we're only looking at one of three total grid squares that we did in the field. And the way we did it is uh, we did it a little bit crudely. If you pay the big bucks um, to buy fancy equipment, you can um, es essentially enter data on the machine itself and then upload to your computer. But we unfortunately do not have that luxury um, at Cuyahoga Community College. So I created a Google Sheet that students were able to then enter data manually onto the Google Sheet, which then I could then copy and paste. So it's sort of like uploading it via computer. It just means there's an added extra step of having to manually type out your data instead of it automatically being logged on the machine itself. But, you know, we'll take what we can get. So what I'm going to do next is actually go to QGIS. QGIS is, um, I don't ask me what the Q stands for, but GIS stands for Geographic Information Systems. So I took the data that was on the Google Sheet, which actually I'm realizing I should just show you the Google Sheet real quick here. So here's the Google Sheet and what it looks like. That's our site number up here, uh, resistivity 33CU536, 33 standing for Ohio alphabetically. Uh, Alaska and Hawaii are put at the end of the 50 states alphabetically because this numbering system was done before they were states. So 33 is Ohio alphabetically if you leave out Alaska and Hawaii. CU stands for Cuyahoga County, and then this is the 536th site inventoried in Cuyahoga County, Ohio. So we've got a lot of data that's been entered manually here. So if we scroll up, we can see we've got our um, east-west line, our eastings, so our x-coordinates, our y-coordinates, which is our north-south or northings. Uh, and then this is resistivity, so everything's measured in ohms. We've got notes, operators, data recorder. And so we haven't finished all the data collection, as you can see. Um, we're still missing some. But I took the second grid square that starts right here, and then I plugged that into... Um, Excel. Now the reason I put it in Excel, and this is not necessarily a tech tutorial on how to do these things, I'm just walking you through um, my process and explaining how I'm going to get to the interpretive maps that we're going to be looking at in a moment here. So I, I plugged it into Excel because unfortunately in Google Sheets um, it's not going to be something I can import into QGIS. I have to first save it as a comma separated uh, file or a comma separated value which essentially the best way to think of that is CSV is one of the most versatile um, file formats for spreadsheets um, because every single one of these cells is essentially a value that is separated by a comma. So another way to visualize this is if we had a text file, which I think that's what this is down here. Um, essentially, if you looked at this as a just straight text, it would be 7.5 comma, 12.5 comma, 100 comma, nothing comma, Doug comma, Eliza comma, um, 10,000 comma 4 comma or rather that would be the end of it and then they'd start a new line so you can imagine that these are stored as text and it looks very very ugly so visually we like to put it into a spreadsheet application like Excel or Google Sheets um, or LibreOffice Calc um, or whatever Apple's is I think it's numbers I don't know um, so the point is when we're visualizing it in an Excel sheet like this uh, really what the computer is running is it's just separating these values with a comma. So CSV, one of the most versatile file formats, it works in all of those other spreadsheet applications. So an Excel file might not be able to be opened in, say, um, an Apple 
program. But every single program is compatible with comma separated values, so a CSV file, which is one of the reasons why we have to enter it into QGIS, because that software is free open access. And because of that, it wants to utilize file formats that are uh, accessible to any operator, whether you're working on Linux, Apple, um, uh, Windows, whether you're using a free application like LibreOffice or you're using um, a specific operating systems um, package. So CSV is what we need to save this as. I also needed to, at least for the resistivity data, I needed to alter some of the data. So you'll notice that this spreadsheet looks slightly different than the spreadsheet we were working on or we just saw in Google Sheets. The difference is uh, that this spreadsheet has additional columns, which I'll scroll up to the top here, squared and log. So essentially these are just two columns that I called squared um, because we wanted to square the values. So one thing that we can't do when we're interpolating the results, um, and I'll get to what interpolation means in a moment, but essentially if I want to make a nice pretty shaded relief map, which is ultimately what we're doing, uh, X marks the spot, so to speak, with geophysics. Um, I can't do that with negative values. And some of the values that we got, as you can see in this example here, negative 6, negative 55, um, we need to convert those into positive values. So the first thing that I did was I squared the values. And then to sort of normalize them, so if you can think um, uh, essentially, actually, let's do this in paint. This is probably the best way I can and quickly graphically illustrate this. So um, if you can imagine a bell curve like this, you've got your, oh boy, let's, let's get rid of that. You've got your X and your Y, and here's your bell curve. So one of the issues that we might encounter is if, say, our curve looks like this, or it looks like this. So we want this normal distribution, which is going to be this guy right here. And the best way to normalize our data so that our mean, median, and mode are kind of coinciding in the center of that little bell curve, that arc, uh, so we don't want something like this or like this, is to normalize that data by squaring it and doing a log transformation. You can see right away, um, if we just took the raw data, first off we have negative values, not going to work in the program that we need to run it in, but setting that aside, We've got um, blank values, which have to be pulled out because 999s will be treated as real values. Oh, sorry, jumped to the end there. Negative values, and then we have these huge swings to positive 222. So this is some big, wide variation there. So we want to kind of compress that so that we don't have these big swings that can really pull our data and stretch it in ways that artificially create variation where we don't necessarily need to worry about variation um, as much. So we square them to get rid of the negative values, but then we still have these gi giant gargantuan numbers. We've got 25 and then 29,000. So these are huge, huge swings in very different directions here. So by taking the logarithmic transformation, essentially all we're doing is we're entering, you can see the equation right here in Excel, equals log and then of the squared value. And so what that does is it basically brings it down into a, a scale of now we've got variation on numbers between 0 and essentially 5. So instead of having 25 as one value and 30,000 as the next, we now have 0, 5. So a lot less a lot less wild pendulum swings there. And by doing that, we're essentially creating uh, another version of this bell curve. We're trying to collapse that data so then um, we're visualizing it slightly differently. No, I don't want to save that. So that's what I had to do for this spreadsheet. I didn't have to do that with the other two, with the soil probes or with the magnet or metal detection because of the way the readings are essentially used and it's not common practice to alter metal detection readings, but we'll get into that in a moment. So here is what it looks like to modify all that data. So I take this, save it as a CSV, and then I import it into um, QGIS. So right now we don't have a whole lot going on in QGIS. Um, if I wanted to, I could zoom out to, um, you know, uh, let's here let's go to this ortho so here's northeast ohio here's you know an aerial map we've got water imported we've got all these different layers so gis means geographic information system you've probably used something similar to this um if you use google, google maps and you toggle between layers um 
all of the spatial data that's you that goes into Google Maps that's behind the scenes that you don't realize, like calculating the most efficient route, whether that's for walking, driving, public transportation, um, bike. Um, those all have different spatial statistics that go into them based on different layers, different input values, but we don't need to get into that. Point is, we've got a fun GIS here. But you'll notice that the data I'm using is nowhere located in our project area. So our project area was in that last one that we just saw, and now we're just in the middle of nowhere. There's nothing behind it. And in fact, if I zoom out, if I keep zooming out, oh, we can see Here's where everything else is in Northeast Ohio. Here's where my project data is. The reason it looks like this is because I never actually gave it um, coordinates in the coordinate plane that we're working in. I just used the raw data. And if we go back to the raw data, we've got 0 0.5 and 10.5. So it thinks that I'm uh, 50 centimeters north of the equator, or rather 50 centimeters east of the uh, zone, um, zone line of zone 17 of this UTM transect um, and I'm 10.5 meters north of the equator which is why we end up in the middle of nowhere very far from all the layers that I've already imported into this project um, but for interpolation and ge you know for geophysical interpretation I don't really care too much about georeferencing it into our project area mostly because the aerial photographs that I'm going to be looking at um, are going to be through wooded trees so there's not going to be a whole lot that I'm going to benefit from seeing it layered onto our actual project area at the moment. So for now, I'm not too concerned about that. Uh, all, I, all I care about is having access to the plugins and the tools that QGIS has available to me. So obviously these are not in the proper coordinates of where they are on the globe, but they are in relative to one another and that's what's important. So you can see here's all of the different readings that we've done. It just looks like a bunch of nice fine dots, right? Because, you know, 50 centimeters, another 50 centimeters, and this is a meter apart from each other. So we've got a nice 10 by 10 grid with uh, roughly 210 readings. So we've sampled in this area 210 samples to represent this area. We could have done every eight centimeters and then we would have had even more dots. We could have done every 50 centimeters east-west. And so we could have increased the sample density however we want to. And that would increase the resolution of our overall um, geophysical map. But for now, for what we're doing, this is perfectly fine. And you'll see if I toggle off these layers by clicking off the check mark, they disappear. But you'll notice they're all in the same spot because we've sampled them with the same sample interval. And that's important because we want the maps to look you know, similar. We want them to have the same sample interval so that we can compare them from, from one to the next. So for resistivity, what I ended up doing is I went up to my plugins here. Um, oh, I have to manage and install plugins. Well, there's a, it's because I'm on a different sign in on this computer. But anyway, there's, a, there's an app called AGT. I think it's Archaeological Geophysical Toolbox or something to that effect. And then we enter in the data that we want to manipulate. And our output ends up looking something like this. So you'll notice it's a shaded relief map. If we look down here at this layer um, on the left here, we can see that the black is 2.15, et cetera, et cetera. And white is 4.40982. So really what we're doing is we're using a tool that was originally developed for understanding drainage and elevation. And we're applying that to anything else. So the way this works is it's spatial, spatial statistics to figure out um, when we're looking at those dots, you know, where what's the directionality here? Originally, it was used to figure out slope. So if you have two points on a map that you've you've um, captured their elevations, what the computer will do is then estimate the slope between those two points. That's what we call interpolating. So when you have two known points and you want to figure out what's going on in between two known points, that's interpolation. If I want to know what's beyond those two points, that's extrapolation. You probably heard extrapolation a lot, but probably not heard a lot of interpolation. So that's what we've just done here, is we've interpolated all of the samples that we've taken of electrical resistivity within our area. And this is based off of the logarithmic transformations. You can imagine it would look like a polka dot mess if we had just done the raw data, actually, we, we would have gotten an error because we had negative values. So if we just did the squared values, we would have definitely gotten a polka dotted mess. So we can see there's a few things going on here. We've got some highlighted areas uh, and then some dark areas. Unsurprisingly, we've got a tree here. So we've got some, some fluctuation, another tree here, and then another tree down here, and I believe another one down here. 
But what's important to note is we want to compare these results to our other two geophysical survey maps. So we've got a dark spot here and a dark spot here. What does that actually tell us? Well, if we go back to our data, I can count over. So this would be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven and a half. And then this would be um, uh, one, two, three, four, five and a half because um, we started at 10.5 on these ones. But if we go back to it, um, let's see here, 7.5. So that'd be um, right in here. So we notice that this zero value is going to be heavily weighted, and that's probably what this dark spot is here, is that zero value is definitely pulling it down here because if low values, low ohm readings are turning out to be closer to zero, then they're going to be darker spots. And if we want to get an electrical resistivity, that means there is lower resistance in these darker patches, higher resistance in the lighter patches. And that kind of makes sense from a general standpoint of when you have uh, roots near trees, they're going to soak up a lot of water. And when you have more water, then you have better con conductivity of electrical currents. So unsurprisingly, the areas around trees and logs and wet areas are going to hold elect or going to have better conductivity because they hold water better. But now we need to compare that to the soil probe survey and the metal detection. So with the metal detection, it's very similar to what we did with the electrical resistivity. We took readings every 50 centimeters north south and every meter east west. Um, the difference is we're doing different electrical currents. In resistivity, it's one volt of current. In um, metal detection, we pump the coil every 50 centimeters and we're getting eddy currents that are being pushed through the soil. And so when we look at those results, we see a very different pattern going on here, right? So a lot of different things going on in this visualization. And I'm actually going to move this over so then I can squeeze my little window here. So you'll notice that same patch that we were just looking at in electrical resistivity is now a very dark patch. And what this is telling us is that this is in the 65.7168 range on the metal detector. These are the ground balance readings. So you have to know a little bit of something about the equipment that you're using. So in the res resistivity data, we know that two and four are not actually reading. So we'd have to go back to the original raw data to compare those anomalies that we see visually and see what the actual readings that we got were. And so in the case of electrical resistivity, we know that this is um, very low resistance areas in this patch right here. When we go back to the metal detection, that same area is a very, very dark patch um, that stands out. And then we get some light shading up in here. Now, normally what we learn from these readings is um, when you're in the, say, 40 to 60s range, you're dealing with a lot of natural mineralization of soils. Once you start to get higher, you're generally dealing with compacted soils, um, disturbed soils, iron-rich soils, um, buried um, transportation routes, so like maybe a gravel road, maybe you're dealing with um, pavement. So if you're walking on a sidewalk, you might overload the sensor. So really what we're seeing here is more likely than not the depth of the subsoil. So with the metal detector, and we could get into the, the mechanics behind it, really what we're measuring is the depth of the B horizon because the B horizon is going to be rich in um, iron bearing minerals. Um, so, you know, the deeper your B horizon, the lower your readings are because the coil can't actually hit that iron. So it's getting a weaker signal, which means the overall ground balance readings decrease. The higher the ground balance reading, Generally speaking, that also means that the B horizon is closer. So in addition to all those other factors I was talking about of compaction, um, you know, obviously if there's metals in the ground, we, those are going to alter the ground balance readings. Um, so really what we're seeing here is that there's a closer to the surface B horizon in these areas and a much deeper B horizon here. So if we combine the electrical resistivity and the ground balance readings, we can start to say, okay, so there's probably water accumulating here. It's probably a deeper B horizon that may be indicative of a feature of some sort that could be a pit feature. So someone dug a refuse pit, maybe someone dug a fire pit, maybe someone put a post hole here. Uh, that's an awfully big post hole if I'm being honest. Um, so it's more likely um, a thermal feature of some sort. We know that there's fire cracked rock in the area around here, not this specific spot, but in areas just to the northwest of it. So we've got some inkling that this might be a feature, right, based on these two data. Now let's combine that with the soil probe data. 
And what we'll do is we'll turn on all these layers. So we can start to see a slightly similar pattern to the metal detection and the resistivity once we know what we're looking for, right? So we've got these uh, dark areas and they've inverted it. Um, and that's just happens to be how the computer decided to program them. But if we go to the soil probe, our black values are 4.61 and these are centimeters into the soil. So essentially what the soil probe was doing is we just had an operator stick the probe into the ground until they hit resistance and then they measured how deep the probe went into the ground. Very simple stuff, right? But we did it systematically and what we're able to see from that is the compaction rates of the soil. And relatively speaking it can give us an idea of you know how compact the soil is but then in some cases also maybe if there's a feature there you might slide through it like butter if there is a b horizon that's close to the surface you might be able to identify it so when we pair it with the um, metal detection we get a better sense of what the subsurface stratigraphy might look like and so what we're seeing here is actually deep deep um, soils or rather less compacted soils looser soils in the center here so if we turn this off and then we see where the resistivity is we can see that there's this general area in the east central portion that tends to have um, deeper soils. So what we're going to do when we go out into the field on Friday, which would be July 9th, is we're probably going to put a test unit right in this area because we've got um, all three of these geophysical techniques have demonstrated that we probably have something going on. There's some sort of anomaly in this area and we want to ground truth it. So we can only learn so much from these interpretations in these interpret interpolation maps. What we now need to do is excavate to figure out what exactly this anomaly is. Is this anomaly, um, you know, it could be a burrow pit from a groundhog or field mice. It could be um, the uh, uprooting of a tree and it's backfilled in from hundreds of years ago. So we don't necessarily know that this is for sure a cultural object, but given the fact that there are artifacts in the area and in, in and around this, this, feature, this anomaly, I should say, we can probably safely deduce that there's a high possibility that that is in fact an archeological feature. And so what we've done here is spent a lot of time in the field as many of my students have learned um, over the past couple of weeks, collecting tediously these samples. So in just this one area, 200 times 3, so 600 and I think it's 210. So 630 some readings between soil probe, metal detection, electrical resistivity, and then combining them using QGIS to then determine this is probably something that we want to look at. So we're using each of the methods to sort of cross check one another. So if we just did metal detection, I would be concerned because I don't have other data that might get a different perspective on what's going on beneath the surface, right? Uh, because there are all sorts of things that can cause metal detection data to come out with different results than, say, electrical resistivity, than, say, um, soil probes. So when we use them in, in tandem, we get a more holistic picture, but ultimately we still have to excavate to find out what's going on. So we're going to go investigate what this weird anomaly is. And hopefully um, we'll find out what, what that looks like over the next couple of weeks. And um, then we'll talk about what we find and interpreting the results of that survey as we move forward. But that's all I wanted to talk about today in this short little lesson in interpreting geophysical maps. Hopefully that helps you out. Even if you're not in my uh, field methods class, that's okay. Uh, maybe you got something out of this um, and learned something. That's going to do it for today. And until next time, never stop learning.